Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this second part of the COVID-19, the Response of African Nations Forum, organized by Universcience IRD and the French Institute. The African content, uh, continent uh, is now experiencing a second wave of COVID-19, particularly in the northern countries and the southern countries. The, uh, according to the World Health Organization, at least 100,000 Africans have desired, died due to the coronavirus and 4 million people have been infected. This may not seem like a lot, uh, but we're going to talk about that this evening. In this uh, conference, we are going to uh, take an inventory of the pandemic. We're going to hear from the different speakers about the health and economic and social measures that have been put into place. What are the assets of the African continent for fighting against this pandemic? And we're going to understand how doctors and researchers are mobilizing to uh, develop tra treatment. You can follow this conference in French or in English. So you just have to choose the right channel. At the end of our discussions at around 8 p.m. French time, I will ask questions, uh, any questions that you will have shared via the chat. So please do not hesitate throughout the conference to raise questions and I will ask them to the speakers at the end. So our speakers, we have a number of speakers and you will see that we are going to travel across the African continent. So we're going to begin in Western Africa with uh, Lucien Monga. Lucien Monga, who is the WHO representative for Congo, the Republic of the Congo. Then we're going to travel to the north to uh, Guinea with uh, Noel Tordo, who's a viro virologist and also president of the French Society for Virology and also works at the Institut Pasteur in Guinea. Then we're going to the north, to Senegal, with uh, Kudia So. Kudia So, you are a doctor and a social anthropologist at the Regional Centre for Research and Training uh, in Dakar. And then we will go to the east, where we will hear from uh, Borna Nyoke, who is a doctor and researcher in uh, infectious diseases. And uh, she is also part of the uh, Drugs for Infectious Disease Initiative. And you will present that initiative. You're in Nairobi. And then we will join Glenda, Glenda Gray in South Africa, who is a part of the South African Medical Research Council. So I suggest, first of all, that we have a virtual uh, introduction, presentation of our speakers. I can't see them. Is that normal? So I can see Lucien Monga, who is here. Uh, thank you very much for turning your cameras on. It's, uh, much more, it's much more convivial this way. So I suggest that we just uh, introduce ourselves very quickly. It is virtual, but that's how things uh, work uh, at the moment. Let's say that we are going to uh, uh, limit greenhouse gas emissions by doing this. So I'd like to hear about the current situation of the pandemic in your countries, uh, an assessment of the deaths, an assessment of the number of infections. Is the second wave over? Has the third wave started? So. We're going to begin with you, Noel Tordo. What is the situation in Guinea at the moment? Please turn on your microphone. Thank you. Well, the situation in Guinea is clearly a second wave. In fact, in Guinea, we experienced the first wave, which was straight after the European wave. We are slightly behind, but we did not have a huge peak, but we did have it. It was kind of spread out over time. Over summer in Europe, things calmed down. So we did not have a real wave in autumn, the same wave that you experienced in Paris. However, since uh, February or March, we are really experiencing a real uh, new wave that is starting. Lucien Monga, good evening. What's the situation in Congo, in the Congo? Sorry. Good evening. Good evening to everyone. We can say that in the Congo, 
up until now, the pandemic was uh, more or less contained because the, the country, since the 20th March, when the latest, uh, the latest figures were published, we had 9,600,000 9, cases, cases. And the death rate was 1.4. And I must say that 92, 93% of these cases are occurring between the two major cities. And there is very little circulation of the virus in the country. We have natural uh, fluctuations. The two major cities are Brazzaville and Pointe Noire. But since February, we have been observing roughly 30 uh, cases per day. And the figures are more or less reliable, are they not? Of course, it depends on how many tests we carry out. Uh, our assessment is relative. What does that mean? It means that when we're experiencing a peak, we can reach maybe 100 or so cases per day but we also need to look at other parameters, such as hospitalizations. This week, right across the country, there were 120 cases, uh, hospitalizations in intensive care. And so this gives us an idea of the current situation. Okay, so let's stick in Western Africa. Could you, so what is the situation in Senegal? Senegal is a hub many people transit via uh, Dakar, and I'm sure that this had an impact on the infection rate. Yes, I think the situation in Senegal was perhaps more difficult. On the 2nd of March, 2020, we uh, saw the first cases. The, fir the second wave began in October, but the first, uh, first wave, we had an average sized peak. And now we're entering the end of the second wave, which was a lot bigger. It was a lot more deadly as well, with a death rate that was much higher. And in total, we have 38,000 cases per 151 uh, deaths and the figures I'm sure are overestimated. Overall, Senegal has been uh, impacted quite a lot by COVID-19. As I said, we're at the end of the second wave, but uh, we will be able to talk about the social and uh, health challenges later on. Yes, we will talk about that later on. Let's go to Western Africa before we go to uh, Kenya. Uh, Noel Tordo, have you been in touch with other uh, PASTA institutes? Do you have news from them? I did get a response from the Central African Republic. The situation is relatively the same. For example, it is clear that in Conakry, and I think it's the same in Dakar, uh, in Senegal, the uh, disease arrived from Europe and the first wave was the European wave that arrived in Africa. This was not as noticeable at the beginning of the uh, pandemic in the CAR last year and the disease came mainly from Cameroon uh, via the transportation of trucks and this is how we saw that the first wave arrived a little later in the CAR than here for example. So this is one of the differences in that country. However, the comments I've heard are more or less the same as us here in Guinea. We identified, we, we carried out 350,000 tests, 20,000 were positive. And this is diff different to what we saw in Senegal, for example, because there were 120 deaths that were recorded. And so I think that the pandemic was perhaps less deadly than in Europe. Okay, so this is a bridge towards uh, uh, 
Eastern Africa. So, uh, uh, Borna Nyoki, what's the situation in Kenya at the moment? Uh, so for Kenya, interestingly enough, our first case was reported in 12th March of 2020. And on 12th March of 2021, we actually, the Ministry of Health announced the third wave. Uh, with the first wave, we had quite a lot of restrictions and lockdowns which were put in place, and a lot of people were able to abide by this. Uh, but then when the restrictions were lessened quite a bit uh, from October to December of 2020, we saw the numbers rise quite rapidly when we experienced our second wave. And by March, uh, this went down again in January and came back up uh, in March. As of yesterday, we had a 19% positivity rate, uh, showing that the numbers have increased. Also, our mortalities have increased with the new variants that have been found within our new patients. Uh, so restrictions and lockdowns have been put in place again uh, to try to contain uh, the areas, especially around the capital city, where these new cases and increased cases are being seen. So to summarize, we can see that the second wave really was much more deadly, much more violent. And now let's see what the capacity to respond in Africa has been. Noel Tordo, at the beginning, you were saying that in Guinea, it was not easy to obtain tests to begin with and that gradually uh, things became more organized. I am going to get closer to the microphone because apparently uh, it's difficult to hear me. So what happened in Guinea is that we were able to benefit in some way uh, from Ebola. It's a strange thing to say, but following Ebola, there was an Ebola response that was implemented and the National Agency for Health Safety took care of a kind of emerging phenomena. And so there was a structure in place at the time when we learned that the pandemic started in Europe. So the first case appeared in Guinea at the same time in Kenya, roughly, I think it must have been around the 15th of March, I believe, the first case of 2020, and this was a case that came directly from Europe, but there was a certain amount of preparation uh, that led to discussions and exchanges between the different laboratories. There were a few labor laboratories, and, and so uh, our organization was not that bad because we were able to very quickly, uh, as you said, uh, uh, we, we, we had a limited amount of tests. There was a huge tension in Europe. And so it was very difficult to transport the tests to Africa. And I think all of the countries will agree with me when I say that uh, significant aid was sent by the Chinese, for example, a lot of uh, uh, tests. And that enabled us when it was very, very tense to be able to, to weather the storm. So that's what helped us. Did you have masks, sanitizer? Is that something uh, that was available in the among the population or was it difficult? Well, we had the same difficulties uh, obtaining what we call the PPE, that is the protective equipment. And this was the case for health workers, the workers who work in uh, laboratories that were doing the sampling. It took a while for us to get the PPE masks arrived a month late and uh, we saw many original ways of wearing masks underneath the chin uh, leaving the mouth exposed etc just to talk about the institut pasteur at the very beginning one of the flagship uh, institutes for uh, sars in Hong Kong, the Institut Pasteur in Hong, in Hong Kong. And thanks to that in Guinea, we were able to have the first tests, PCR tests to identify the first cases. And these first cases were identified by the National 
health, public health department, and we were able to receive tests from Hong Kong. We had positive feedback from the Germans. There was international collaboration to try to help the situation, which is not an easy situation. We did not know how to test for COVID when it first arrived. Mr. Manga, you were saying that in uh, the Congo, in the beginning, the pandemic was well managed, even if you say the second wave was much more violent. How did the government attempt to manage the pandemic and what resources did you have and do you have today? Please uh, turn on your microphone. Yes, you'll have to keep reminding me. Thank you very much. Uh, I think contained is perhaps a better uh, term. If we take a look at the situation in the other countries in Central Africa, the Congo is in a slightly better situation. I've always thought, and I've always said, the Congolese government really managed the pandemic in a smart way. They were very smart and flexible. The first case was declared on the 14th of March. And each time there was a response from the government, first of all, in terms of transparency, it was quite difficult in a number of countries. Once the first case was identified and the authorities made announcements, all of the cases were monitored and were communicated by the government so that the population, the public, was informed about the gravity of the situation and so that they could prepare what was to come. So that was transparency. As it relates to the measures, Congo is one of the countries that very, very quickly implemented all of the measures that are very difficult but they implemented them simultaneously. So uh, following the uh, statement from the President of the Republic during his address to the nation on the 28th of March, two weeks later, everything was implemented. Everything was implemented on the same day. The closure of schools, isolation of uh, infected cases, closure of uh, markets, wearing of masks, all of these measures, the, the curfew as well. All of these measured made it possible to respond very quickly and to limit the spread of the disease. And it is not by chance that the spread was contained. And even today, these measures are still in place. Most of these measures are still in place. In Congo, we still have a curfew. Uh, that is to say, during the week, it's uh, between 5 a.m. and 11 p.m. And on the weekend, it is shortened to 10 p.m. All religious uh, gatherings have been prohibited. A number of measures have been implemented. Markets are no longer open every day of the week. The opening of the markets is limited. The population has been encouraged to wear masks. And so I think that all of these measures and also the efforts that have been made to maintain these measures have significantly contributed to containing the pandemic. I think uh, it's an example that we can analyze further, but I think that we reacted very well at the beginning and this enabled us to manage uh, the uh, pandemic and the disease. And I say all of this to say that this is a very important point. Every few weeks, the National Commission is chaired by the president, by the president, and this is held every three weeks, where we have a breakdown, including uh, experts. And we've had a case where uh, the infection rate started to go back up again, and straight away, further measures were implemented. And so this is how we have managed to keep this pandemic at an acceptable level.
Borna Nyoke, how would you describe the situation in Kenya as it relates to what was described in, in uh, Guinea and Congo? Mrs. Nyoke, how would you describe the situation in Kenya? I think the image is frozen. Okay, so let's uh, move on to Kudyasul. Kudyasul, you are a social anthropologist. What's interesting, and we'll see what the other speakers say, but I think that in the beginning, what was important is we had to explain what the epidemic was and explain why it was dangerous for African populations, that it wasn't just a Western disease. Did you notice this? Yes, actually, at the beginning, people were skeptical because they didn't know about the disease. There wasn't enough information. There were a few cases. So I think people had really superficial knowledge and step by step, during the first wave, people saw what was happening in the world. We live in a global village. They saw what was happening in China, what was happening in Europe. And uh, like in other countries, there were uh, very strict measures that were implemented, uh, security measures, health measure measures, but also social measures. When lockdown was deciding during the first wave, borders were closed as well, schools were closed, and the government tried to implement measures to support the population, social measures to support uh, the most vulnerable people who could not work anymore, people who uh, couldn't work because they uh, used to work on markets, so there were social measures. Uh, people uh, managed to receive uh, some food support as well. The poorest uh, were helped as well. So uh, there were different kinds of measures. But after a few weeks, the social effects of the measures, the socioeconomic consequences were heavy, especially, uh, you know, uh, 80% of the population here uh, gets uh, revenues from uh, sources that are informal. So the government uh, decided to change its response. And there were, as you know, uh, mobilizations by the population, some protests, and uh, that was towards the end of the first wave. So, the situation has evolved. You know that there was a lot of uncertainty. And during the second wave, it was a little bit different because the second wave was more deadly. It was more visible. More people were impacted. I think the issue of the visibility and the credibility uh, became important because people were confronted with the reality of the pandemic. So people, I think, really understood what was happening especially when some uh, famous people died. Uh, so the way COVID-19 was experienced was different uh, then. People understood a lot more about the disease. There was a debate. I don't know um, what it was presented like in your countries. There was a debate in France about Professor Raoult. Uh, was there any kind of echo in your countries? Uh, was it complicated in some of your countries uh, because of this uh, situation? Uh, Mr. Tordeau, can you tell us uh, a few words about this? Well, there was a debate organized in uh, the community uh, and uh, French people living in Guinea uh, debated about this the same way French people were debating in France. So to add to what was just said, in Guinea, uh, measures were taken, places of worship were closed. Uh, it was not allowed to meet in groups. 
the council met twice a week. So compared with Mali, Côte d'Ivoire and Senegal, uh, and Sierra Leone and Liberia, uh, there were uh, the same kind of measures, very strict measures. One of the measures that was adopted was to use a new hospitals. It was actually an old hospitals that uh, was being renovate, renovated. Um, and this hospital, it wasn't finished yet. And Lima, an NGO, set up this hospital in that place to be able to take in patients, take care of them. And it was a little bit more sophisticated. If you want, it was an emergency hospital. And I think there was up to 500 patients in that hospital. And in this place and in other hospitals in Conakry, uh, there was chloroquine that was used until there was no chloroquine anymore. And uh, vitamin C, for example, was used as well. And a lot of these patients uh, did not have symptoms. I actually met uh, people that, you know, uh, gave me a few calls uh, because at the Institut Pasteur we were doing some screening because they had uh, secondary effects uh, that in my opinion were more psychological uh, than physical. So the chloroquine, yes, it was something that was debated here. Raoul here uh, I think was quite popular I think a lot of people here um, knew about it. Uh, I know it was not always the, the case in France. I'm part of the French Society for Virology. But in Guinea, yes, there were supporters of Professor uh, Raoult. And Lucien Manga, was there an impact in Congo? Was it debated as well? Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, well, uh, we were ready to try any solution, I would say. We discovered the clinical signs then, and it was really hard to find the right therapeutic regimes from the start. So, well, you know, the situation has evolved. In Congo, we have a technical coordination. There are subgroups, a coordination, a coordination group, a technical group, and health professionals uh, are trying to evaluate the situation. And when there was a debate on a chloroquine, there was a time uh, when uh, we thought about uh, using it and it was actually used, but I don't think that it is uh, currently. So I think what's interesting is that the way it was managed is that local authorities were really um, taking care of screening, uh, patient care, and later on, the private sector has uh, started to be involved. Uh, so there were some, uh, you know, uh, people did what they could and tried different things, I would say. But uh, there were debates in the commission that I mentioned before, the technical committee, to try to find the best solutions. I see uh, Mrs. Nyaoki, you're here. Welcome back. You are a member of the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, and you have created a coalition, a coalition to accelerate research on the continent 
and to try to find local solutions to the pandemic. Can you tell us a bit more about this initiative, please? Thank you. I hope I don't drop off in the middle again. Uh, so yes, I work for. We have I work for drugs, drugs for neglected diseases initiative, um, which is headquartered in Geneva, but we have offices all across the world. I am currently located in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, so for drugs for neglected diseases, initially its main focus was on neglected tropical diseases. And with that, we've been able to form quite a huge collaborative um, system in the different countries where we conduct clinical trials from leishmaniasis to sleeping sickness uh, to mycetoma. So we have offices, we have uh, partners, we have academic institutions and Ministry of Health um, in different countries that we have been working with in the past uh, almost 13 years. Um, so when we had the COVID pandemic come in, uh, one of the questions that came to us because of course the clinical trials were adversely affected. Uh, the people that we work with in the different countries had been affected either by the restrictions, by the lockdown, by the infection with the COVID itself. So it became how can we help uh, uh, our people or how can we be able to do something more at this particular time because of course the NTDs were not the focus at this particular time. Uh, so at that particular point, we had the COVID-19 Clinical Research Coalition. This is a coalition of more than 198 institutional members of our 60 countries. And this is across the globe from Europe to Asia to Africa. And within that, uh, we had working groups. And these working groups include from ethic and regulatory um, um, working groups to clinical management. And in part of that, it was try, trying to push for the advocacy of ensuring that clinical researchers, uh, especially in the low and middle income countries, are part and parcel of getting a solution to COVID. Uh, and within this, we were able now to actually launch the anti-COVID clinical trial. And this is an open label uh, adaptive and comparative uh, platform trial uh, that is going to be looking at uh, treatments for mild to moderate COVID-19. Uh, we aim to enroll more than 3,000 patients in uh, 13 countries across Africa and uh, in within 19 different sites. And part of the reason of starting this within Africa, at that particular time, we noticed that um, a lot of clinical trials had already taken off. Uh, we had so many trials in China, we had so many trials in Europe, but we do understand that whatever therapeutics or vaccine that would be found need to be applicable to our settings. We need to be ensured that they would be accepted and put in our treatment guidelines. We need to be sure that they would be applicable to us because we are aware that our genetic diversity is one of the largest across the world. And all these things pushed us to ensure that uh, while we were racing to find treatments and how to prevent COVID, apart from the preventive tactics that we're using, that we were able to find therapeutics to be able to assist with this. So what types of treatments, for example, uh, were experimented on? So we started last year when we launched the clinical trial in the DRC. And at that particular point, we were looking at hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir ritonavir. Uh, but uh, due to other clinical trials that are going across the world, uh, we did get the WHO a recommendation that was strongly against uh, these two arms. And uh, as I mentioned, part of this trial, it's an adaptive uh, platform trial. So at any point, the study design allows us to remove or add any investigational arms when any added benefits have been seen or from other clinical trials, we are able to get results. So we paused uh, the clinical trial in December of last year as we tried to look at other arms and we're currently reviewing other antivirals and antiparasitics, and we're hoping we'll be able to restart within the next few weeks. And have you already, already obtained results or is it too soon? 
Uh, it's quite soon, uh, considering that we are restarting with uh, new arms, uh, but it is expected to be a short trial because most of the drugs that we're looking at, we are repurposing them, so we already have the safety profiles in place. Uh, so it's more of the efficacy against the SARS-CoV-2. So the trial would take at least six to seven months, and we would be hoping that by the end of the year, we would have results that would be able to help a lot of African countries that do not have uh, set guidelines for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID. And so the 19th of March 2020, so 20 days after the confirmation of the first case of COVID in sub-Saharan Africa, the director of the WHO said that Africa should brace for the worst. And this was based on the observations made uh, uh, that uh, the African health systems would not be able to respond to the pandemic. But I think that we can say now that uh, the worst did not come. So. What assets did the African content, continent have to face this epidemic? I would like for us to talk about it now. Is it its youth, its experience of epidemics, uh, such as uh, uh, HIV, um, AIDS, um, Ebola? Uh, Mr. Tordo, how do you perceive this uh, resilience, even if there were cases and deaths, unfortunately, but compared to other parts of the world, there was uh, some African resilience, would you not say? Yes. Well, let's say, uh, obviously we didn't count all of the deaths here because in Guinea, uh, for example, um, I think that we have already, uh, we speculated uh, quite a lot on the reasons. The reasons are that yes, the African population, uh, at least in Guinea, but I think it's similar elsewhere in Africa, the population is a lot younger than in Europe. That is a fact. And so we know that uh, you're affected more the older you are there has also uh, been the potential explanation uh, that is to say that uh, uh, people who are uh, who uh, are regularly exposed to particular diseases infections uh, are uh, there are a higher number of those people uh, in africa than in europe and when you have a resistance to an infection, uh, you have a system that is made up of different stages. So you have uh, uh, your immunity, uh, which means that people are perhaps uh, more prepared. Uh, that could be a, another explanation. The uh, fact that uh, similar viruses perhaps already circulated among the population, this may have led to a certain level of immunity. Uh, even if those viruses or those infections are not completely the same as uh, COVID. So these are some of the reasons that we could give uh, for which uh, things went much better in Africa than in Europe. We don't have the same climate either. And even if in Africa there are regions that have been uh, effective, have been impacted more. If we take a look at uh, the north of Africa and the south of Africa, uh, during the rainy seasons, uh, the temperatures are uh, are quite uh, starkly different. And so there are a number of reasons that we can give, a lot of explanations that we can give for this. Just to come back to the point about uh, treatments, in Guinea, there were a number of treatments as well that were tried. Some of them were were good, some of them weren't. Uh, and uh, I mentioned uh, the immunity, this kind of innate immunity. And uh, the Cubans produce interferon and uh, they tested it out. The results have not been uh, published, but uh, clinical trials were carried out. Uh, local medicines were also tested, but I don't know how successful they were. I haven't seen any figures. so. I will say that uh, there have been a number of possibilities in terms of treatment. As it relates to Africa's resilience, we can say that thankfully, uh, Africa has been lucky. And I think that we will discuss this later on. But I think uh, that uh, what we see now is that we don't have that many cases and therefore we don't have that many vaccines. 
well, we will await the arrival of Glenda uh, uh, Gray, who will talk about the vaccine later on. So let's stick uh, on this point about the resilience of Africa. How do you see it, uh, Mr. Manga? Well, in addition to what uh, Noel just said, and uh, something that I agree with fully, I think it will take some time before we can understand the reasons for this resilience. Even if we see great differences among the different countries. Another thing that I could add is that the epidemic arrived later in Africa. This meant that we were able to anticipate, we were able to aware, raise awareness, and we were able to prepare in anticipation. The second point, I think that uh, African governments were in a tight spot, and we must not underestimate this. They were very serious when it came to the implementation of encouraging measures in socio-economic contexts, which are very difficult. And I think because of this, there was greater discipline among African populations and greater take up uh, of government measures. One cannot deny that this had an impact, a significant impact on the evolution of the pandemic. And my final point, there are also external resources In Central Africa, uh, people are taking a number of different uh, therapies or treatments. We don't know whether this is having an impact or not. And so there are a combination of factors uh, that meant that Africa was spared from the worst. And again, thankfully so, because if we were to have a health crisis that uh, similar to other countries, then I think that uh, things would have been different. Great, okay, so uh, Borna Nyoke, what do you think about this African resilience? Would you like to add something? Uh, yes, uh, definitely quite a lot of theories have come up because as you mentioned, uh, we were preparing body bags because the whole question was, if this is what is happening in America and Europe, what exactly is going to happen in Africa? Uh, we knew our ICU capacity or critical care management was barely there and we would not be able to handle these severe cases. Uh, so this is also where our clinical trial comes in because apart from the main uh, study, where we're looking at the drugs and the treatment, we also have ancillary studies in epidemiology and immunology, just to look at antibody uh, cellular and humoral responses that uh, the people have within the continent, and also if there are any epidemiological factors that have affected the spread of the disease. I think uh, this would be able to help uh, answer a lot of questions because we still seem to have quite a number of more questions than answers at the moment. And um, even as we have more of these answers, they still, they're still quite theoretical and uh, they keep on moving as we find new information every day. So we are hoping that very soon we'll have our own clinical data or our own social demographic data that is able to uh, give answers to how Africa has responded to COVID. And could you say, how do you see uh, this uh, resilience and the fact that uh, we thought that it was going to be terrible for Africa. And even if uh, Senegal was uh, impacted quite severely, it has not been as dramatic as uh, what was expected. Yes, I do think that there was a real movement of resilience. On one hand, African populations are perhaps more used to these health crises and they are more attentive to these uh, situations and health is uh, constantly threatened by uh, different threats and this means that there is greater vigilance. In any case for Senegal there was a 
genuine dynamic, uh, a genuine response and a combined efforts on the part of the state for the populations. I have not had the, I did not have the opportunity to mention this earlier on, but yesterday, for example, the Professor Raoul was uh, received by the Senegalese president and he even received uh, a medal from the president. And so I think that we have to really take a look at everything in the context of scientific uncertainty. Healthcare professionals did not have the treatments at the beginning. And so there was a, a phenomenon where people really held on to some of the treatments. And even if uh, uh, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine um, uh, led to a lot of debate, very quickly there were restrictions uh, applied. And in the end, what we saw is that we had the same problem. So we needed uh, oxygen for people uh, with comorbidities. We needed to ensure that we had enough ICU beds. And all of this meant that the state had to take a closer look at the uh, situations in the hospitals. The interpreter apologizes. We seem to have lost connection. And so the government, the state had to, in the face of this situation, implement a system to strengthen the health system. That's important. So COVID-19 was also a catalyst the proportion of the health budget in uh, Africa's overall budget is very low, particularly in most countries. And I think that there has been this awareness of the urgency um, of this pandemic. A number of resources were uh, made available, um, but I also think uh, that attention has been drawn to health professionals, but also to their conditions. And I think that all of this will lead to uh, greater resilience of the systems which at the moment are increasingly uh, faced with um, non-transmissible diseases, so uh, cancers, etc., which are increasing and which is also having an impact on health systems and healthcare systems. So I think that all of this will uh, lead to uh, a response being developed. Noel Tordo, who has experiences from other pandemics such as HIV or Ebola, has that helped to uh, um, to uh, to helped us to adapt to this pandemic? Absolutely. I apologise. Sorry, was that question for me? No, but go ahead. Uh, Noel Tordo will answer later on. Go ahead, Mrs. So. I apologise. In any case. I think that yes, indeed, the HIV AIDS epidemic was the first major pandemic which really affected Africa and which meant that Africa had to implement a number of measures, in particular in the community. And then also health measures as well, because antiretroviral treatments are available. However, if the principle, was the principle of uh, community mobilization uh, was uh, chosen in Senegal, I don't know whether all the HIV expertise were really mobilized. And so behind all of this, there are a number of underpinning principles, autonomy, leadership, these are things that are very important. And in my opinion, these things were not harnessed fully. What we saw was the state and the health system that really uh, demonstrated leadership. The interpreter apologizes, but cannot hear the speaker. I think I should allow the others to speak perhaps. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Tordo. Um, I'd like to hear your take on uh, the experience of previous epidemics. You were a key player uh, in uh, the Ebola pandemic. Yes, that is right. 
I heard a couple of interesting points there. What was implemented during the major wave of Ebola, so between 2013 to 2016, there was an organization among the community agents for Ebola. There were issues with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, which were addressed by the community. Uh, there were some doctors that were that were um, uh, had difficulties with uh, the community because there was not enough pre preparation. And therefore, uh, COVID has been able to benefit from the fabric that has been created and the structures that have been created. Following the Ebola crisis, uh, 2013 to 2016, intelligently, the Guinean government was able to expand the structure to uh, the sanitary body. And that meant that when the COVID crisis uh, arrived, there were a number of reflexes uh, that were put into place. And you know that we are currently experiencing a second wave of Ebola uh, that started on Valentine's Day. That's a good, uh, a good pointer, the 14th of February. And this uh, is currently being uh, contained because very quickly, even if all of our teams are very, very tired, the Ebola has been contained to where it arose. That is to say in the forestry area of Guinea, lots of research has been done. Lots of contact tracing has been done. There's, there are vaccines. Uh, a vaccine was developed during the first wave of Ebola for the second wave. And so now this means that you know, within 40 days, we are now ensuring that we try to contain it before we can announce the end of the Ebola epidemic. So we learn little by little. We must not forget two key things. And I apologize for talking too much. But we need structures. That's the first thing. We need to implement structures. The biggest problem is that we have people who have the relevant experience and that maintain the competency and skills that are required. We need to maintain that, that's very important. We need to ensure that we continue capacity building over the long term. And then we also need to ensure that we use detection systems. So for Ebola, for example, you know that everyone was turned towards Africa and now the uh, everyone is looking after themselves. But at the time, everyone was focused on Africa. And to come back to what was said initially, the big three, including HIV, meant that there, and this was said by uh, the two speakers, it meant that there was monitoring of HIV through a number of uh, techniques, PCR, etc., and this meant that people that we that people had already gained the skills and competencies that were gained during the HIV epidemic, even if COVID is much different. And so this is how we were able to manage things. So I think those are two very important things. We need to talk to people, and I'm sure Madame So will not disagree with me. We need to talk to communities and we need to also uh, ensure that we have expertise and we need to maintain the level of expertise that we acquire. Okay, brilliant, thank you very much. So we have two speakers who have just joined us, welcome. So we have now with us Glenda Gray, good evening, who is the chair of the South African Medical Research Council. And we will have the opportunity to hear about uh, South Africa and uh, we also have a Nikes in Dembi. Can you perhaps turn on your camera for us, please? Yes, no? Yes, sir, there you are, we can see you, that is brilliant. So you are a virologist and you work for the Africa CDC. You are in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. So. I would like to ask Glenda Gray and Nikesa Ndebi to uh, join our conversation uh, and begin by give us, giving us an inventory in each of your countries or your regions. Uh, 
Nikes Ndembi, you have an African uh, vision, a Pan-African vision of uh, this uh, pandemic. We have people from Congo here. We have people from uh, Kenya, Senegal, Guinea. So those are the four countries that we've spoken about so far. But what about the rest of Africa? How did the how is the pandemic going? We mentioned that there was a certain resilience in Africa, uh, Africa, a continent for which there was great fear at the beginning of the pandemic. What would your overview be of the pandemic at the level of the continent? Would you like me to answer in French or in English? As you wish, but it would be better if you left your camera on. I have some bandwidth issues. I will turn it on, but I just wanted to ensure that you could hear me. Well, we can try. And if we can't hear you, then I will tell you. And then we will uh, turn the sound. We'll just keep the sound. Are you able to activate the camera? Brilliant, that's great, thank you. Can you uh, tell us uh, what's happening on the continent today? Can you give us an overview of what's happening in March? Uh, yes, I can uh, talk about epidemiology. May I show you a PowerPoint presentation? Is that okay with you? Sure. Uh, so do you have the adequate rights to share your screen? I think so. <laughs> and then press Alt S and you can share your screen. If it's not possible, let's not lose too much time, but sure, it could be practical. Are you able to share your screen? Apparently not. You have disabled the screen sharing option. I think it would be better for you if you were able to see uh, my presentation for the five regions in Africa. Can someone from Inversions find a solution? If you'd rather speak in English, there are interpreters so you can speak in French or in English. It's up to you. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Wonderful. So it will be easier if you can all take a look at my presentation, I think. This is an overview of the situation in Africa. What you see on your left is a map of Africa with a country reporting COVID-19 cases. I think it's quite easy to understand uh, there's only one country where is more than 500,000 cases, that's South Africa. The uh, lethality rate is 2.5%. And there, you have the numbers until the 18th of March here. So, on your left are the, the evolutions of the new cases between 1st and 28th of March. On your right, you can see the new um, cases. There is a decrease in Central Africa. Numbers are 
going down in some regions, whereas in others, in West Africa, for example, there are more new cases. Here, you can see the new COVID cases reported per million inhabitants. We don't have numbers for Cameroon or Tanzania here. There is less uh, than five cases per million per day for 25 countries, 19 countries with five to 50 cases for 1 million people a day. So here is a summary. There are 11 countries. So 20% of the African Union member states that are currently experiencing a sustained upward trend for the period 1st to 28th of March. Another important element, the variants of concern that have an impact on uh, the rolling out of vaccines on the continent. You can see that on the map on your right. What's important to mention here is that the African Union with WHO have established genomic sequencing and as have used samples to examine these variants of concern. So about the case fragility ratio, the case fertility rate, you can see a map of the whole continent again. You can see Sudan and Egypt with a very high case fertility rate. And uh, 10 countries of a uh, rate that is lower than 1%, 23, 2.2%. About screening now, tests. So far, more than 39.7 million tests have been conducted on the continent with a ratio of 9.5 tests per reported case and 10.6% positivity rate. About test positivity by country here. So six countries have a less than 2% positivity, 17, two to seven test positivity for seven to 10 positivity. So, uh that's what i want to talk about can you uh, tell us in a minute about the vaccine strategy uh, thanks for this presentation that was very clear it's really a snapshot of the situation on the continent but now i would like to give the floor to glenda gray glenda so glenda gray just to remind that you are the chair of the south african medical research council uh, south africa has been most affected uh, on the african continent so what is the current state of the pandemic in your country at the moment Do you have the translation?
So the Pfizer vaccine works. Thank you very much for that snapshot of the situation in South Africa. Before giving the floor to the other speakers, Nikes and Nombi, perhaps you can tell us about where we are with the vaccination campaign in Africa. Okay. Oh, now I can hear you in English. It can be quite difficult sometimes. So uh, now, uh, the vaccination program. So as I was saying, it's easier for the uh, speakers to have a, an overview with this presentation, with this uh, slide. So we have uh, areas where we were not able uh, to roll out uh, the vaccine in on the continent. So it has not progressed as quickly as other countries. And so here, if we uh, circle Africa, we can see that only a few countries have received the first uh, doses of uh, the vaccine through the COVAX program. At the level of the continent, we uh, see that the aim is to vaccinate 60% of the population. This is not very ambitious because when we see the United States, the aim is 80%, China between 70 and 80 by mid 2022, and Italy 80% by the end of September. Our target is 60%, a minimum of 60%. Now, two things, we need access to vaccines the second point is the vaccination program and the rollout of the vaccines. So as I said, things are not progressing as we had hoped. Some countries have received 3000 um, doses. That's the case for Nigeria, for example. And so we see a similar thing across the continent. What the CDC wants to do is to roll out mega vaccination centers, which will be funded by the African Union and the European Union. We have funds that will be rolled out for this. And then we also have other partnerships as well to roll out the vaccine. The Africa CDC also has a platform where we can have information about how the vaccine rollout is progressing, how many individuals have been vaccinated or inoculated based on the vaccines that have been rolled out. What about COVAX? Well, before the 31st of May, 75 million doses of AstraZeneca will be rolled out across the continent, content, and uh, roughly 320,000 Pfizer vaccines. Can you explain what COVAX is? Yes, you're right. COVAX is a program which is supported by 
the WHO, UNICEF and CEPI as well. And it is funded by donors. And these vaccines are, are provided for your charge. And they will be rolled out in eligible countries. That is to say, low middle income countries. So developing countries. So this is a program that funds the rollout of the vaccine. But the target is 20% of the population. And what we've seen is that if we only vaccinate 20% of the African population, I mentioned the waves that we've had, and I mentioned that in my first presentation. But if we can't vaccinate at least 60% of the population, we will continue to have these successive waves and it will have significant impact on our economy. Obviously, there is also the closure of schools, the closure of borders, and we really want to avoid all of that by vaccinating 60% of the population. Go ahead, do you have a question? Yes. You also, do you have the Chinese and Russian vaccines? Well, actually, I did want to mention that. We do need access to, to funding, in fact. For funding, the, what the African Union has done is we've mobilized a $2 billion through a funding mechanism and via this mechanism, we have been able to secure 270 million doses. And this will enable us to, to vaccinate at least half of the, uh, the target population on the continent. So to come back to your question about the Chinese vaccine and the Russian vaccine, on this slide, you can see that 25 countries were able to obtain or obtain access to vaccines via the COVAX program. But this vaccine allocation will not make it possible for us to reach our objective. And this is why we have seen the AVET initiative from the African Union, which will enable countries such as Gabon that does not have access to the COVAX because they are not uh, classified as uh, low or middle income countries. So, member states of the African Union, 13 countries specifically, were able to access the vaccine via bilateral initiatives with China and also with Russia. And so there are 17 countries that have already had access to the vaccine. And this will enable us to have a coverage of 30 to 60 percent in those countries. So Mauritius, Zimbabwe. But here we have a hybrid system. So we have the COVAX program, we have the African Union program, AFAT, and then also bilateral initiatives as well that you see in yellow here. What should be noted is that there are eight countries that have already reached 60 percent coverage through vaccines. This includes Nigeria, Zambia, Gambia, Lesotho, Ghana, Egypt. Yes, Nigeria, despite it's very popular, it, the, despite the fact that it's very populous. Yes, that is true. So via the COVAX program, we were able to um, obtain a number of vaccines. These countries that we see here are mobilizing resources. There are private initiatives as well that uh, will uh, fund the uh, vaccination campaign as well. And so they're really firing on all cylinders to try to ensure that we are able to hit the 60% uh, target. I'm going to leave you with this slide. You can see the distribution of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and the other vaccines across the continent. Rwanda is the only country to have obtained three different types of, of the vaccine, AstraZeneca, Moderna and Pfizer, BioNTech. And the Seychelles 
they have already vaccinated over 60% of their population. So that's uh, 6 million people already vaccinated. So what are the takeaways? African countries are making substantial efforts uh, beyond the COVAX program to be able to mobilize financial resources to have greater access to other vaccines. vaccines. And Europe and the United States are helping to try to resolve this. We also have the uh, phenomenon of these new uh, variants and uh, their and how effective vaccines are in the face of these new uh, variants. So we need to look into this further. I'll conclude there. Thank you, thank you very much. It was a very clear presentation. I would like to know now how, what the experience was across the country. So, Noel Tordo in Guinea, can you tell me uh, what are your reactions to what have just been presented? Yes, there's still the presentation on the screen. Uh, you see Guinea in orange is the only one uh, in orange. So Sputnik 5 Sinopharm. So what happened in Guinea? Uh, the COVAX initiative uh, started. Uh, and at the end of May, we started the process. So May 2020. Or maybe August. Like uh, the previous speaker said, COVAX, well, the COVAX initiative will only happen at the end of May for us. So uh, the previous speaker talked about 60%, 60% uh, 60 that are not vaccinated, but that should be vaccinated, right? So that is what we will try to do. However, we've made many efforts and it's actually bilateral efforts that have worked best. And that's why we got the Sputnik uh, vaccine. 20,000 doses uh, were sent, 100,000 doses from Sinopharm. So we already have these vaccines and we have started um, using the vaccines. So 60,000 AstraZeneca doses were mentioned before, but there should also be vaccines from Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson sent by the African Union. So COVAX has promised uh, 860,000 doses uh, for the end of May. I haven't uh, done the mass, but um what's happening is that uh, these vaccines uh, the generic vaccines are coming in later and the bilateral initiatives were faster at least for us here in guinea and it's similar to what happened in europe there were orders and then uh, it turned out that some bilateral agreements worked better than the common ones Please, uh, Mr. Uh, and Nabi, can you just stop uh, using the screen? Yeah, thank you. Uh, although it was a very interesting map. Uh, Mrs. Kudiaso, I feel like you wanted to talk about um, community initiatives in Senegal. Am I right? Yes. I think it hasn't been mentioned, but in Senegal, like for Guinea, uh, bilateral efforts were more successful at first with the Sinopharm vaccine, the Chinese vaccine uh, came first. And what happened is that people uh, were quite reluctant. We did some studies in our research programs with Ari Yaakov, and an IRD program. And we analyzed the ownership of uh, 
the population in Senegal, most people were not in favor of uh, using the vaccine. The government has started a communication campaign around the vaccine and tried to encourage vaccination and people having lived through the crisis and COVID-19 uh, and having seen what happened to what happened to some of the leaders has uh, changed its opinion. And so I think the Chinese uh, vaccine was distributed in a matter of a couple of weeks. So people are actually adhering to the vaccine more. Uh, and there were the vaccines from the COVAX initiatives as well. And you should know that the first people uh, that got the vaccine were elderly people and uh, healthcare professionals, health workers. And in Europe, uh, the immunization campaign stopped after side effects were noticed. So after uh, that, I think people uh, started worrying again and be reluctant to be vaccinated. Again, the government has started a communication campaign. There are still people who do not want any kind of vaccine, but uh, LD, elderly people or people with comorbidities uh, still get vaccinated. So it's uh, now a process that is more common in our country and actually younger people are getting vaccinated. Uh, Glenda Gray. I think that you had a comment about Nigeria. You were saying- uh, Yeah, I'm a bit confused. You know, when I'm looking at the, the vaccine tracker, maybe Nikkei can show that slide again. I show um, you know, very little coverage in Africa. Um, you know, not, not, and, and he's, you know, so Nikkei showed a slide that showed 60%. I mean, you went to, just Nikkei, if you can show that, not, not the up next slide, two up, I think. Um, you showed that slide where there's 60% coverage. Um, and when I look at the data, you know, um, in the Lesotho has got 10,000 vaccines. So I don't understand, you know, so, um, and you say that Nigeria has 60% um, has of the population coverage. But when I look at, at the data, uh, I see that, um, you know, that Nigeria has only 277,000 uh, vaccinations occurring. So, um, I, you know, I don't know if this is, is this aspiration? Um, you know, so you, if you have, if you already have 60% of the vaccines in your country, how come they haven't been delivered? Yeah. Yeah, but over how many uh, how many months? You know, so I think you have to be very careful about how you say this data in your case. Um, you know, so 60% over two years, 60% over one year, 60% in the next six months. Yeah, but that's a very important, you know, so can I just object, you know, so you can't portray, you know, the way you portrayed the slide implied that, uh, you know, that, you know, you should have said this is by 2025, unless I was still listening to the French uh, um, interpretation.
And maybe I think on that's your clear slide now. should say, maybe the slide should say percentage of population to be covered um, by 2022. I think, to, because I think that your the whole slide misrepresents um, the importance of it. I'm sorry to make this point, but I think it's very important. You, we, we must, we have to emphasize how little um, we have, we, you know, we, we have done in Africa. So, Glenda Gray, I had a question for you because uh, South Africa has been uh, struggling for a number of uh, months, actually with India to uh, have a uh, lifting of the eventual restrictions on uh, vaccines and other medical uh, products required to fight against the pandemic. This could uh, allow a number of African countries to access the vaccine more easily and to treatments more easily. Have you followed uh, this and you know where we are with it at the moment? Um, so I, th I think in terms of vaccine access, South Africa um, has obviously because of our variant, we've had to um, um, not use uh, the Serum Institute AstraZeneca vaccines and have had to move towards using J and J or Pfizer. Um, obviously, the, there is um, an issue with um, um, in a, whether whether it's India or whether it's um, uh, Europe um, around the um, control of, of vaccine movement. At a, at a global level, and um, as as you know, I think South Africa has now started to to do fill and finish and tech transfer for J and J with its Aspen plant in in um, in um, in the Eastern Cape, and hopefully that will support um, the movement of of vaccines into Africa. Um, and there is a commitment uh, by J and J to supply 400 million doses of vaccine to Africa um, and mostly supported by the Aspen plant in South Africa. In terms of um, uh, um, in other issues, obviously at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a continent level and at a country level, uh, there have been very little therapeutic advances that we've been able to access besides oxygen and, and uh, dexamethasone. Um, there, um, we are still evaluating and Talking about the monoclonal antibodies that are that are being used in other parts of the world, but essentially, um, in terms of COVID uh, therapeutics, we've only really been able to use oxygen and and dexamethasone. And hopefully, um, in the next in the next year, um, you know, we can start um, working with um, countries that are investigating monoclonal antibodies. I see. Lucien Monga, how is the vaccination campaign uh, being rolled out in the Congo? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, everything that was said was really interesting. I think we need to keep in mind that there are two different processes, there are mechanisms of international solidarity whose goal uh, is, and actually the COVAX initiative is part of this. Um, so there are mechanisms of solidarity that should guarantee a certain level of uh, equality in terms of access to vaccines. The idea is not that everyone will be vaccinated, but that we should all have an equal access to vaccines. So there are initiatives for countries with uh, less resources or uh, less access to uh, be able to access vaccines really to answer to their uh, priority needs. So uh, the COVAX initiative is a part of this uh, solidarity effort. And of course, we have to uh, deal with the fact that there are many tensions linked to the production of the vaccines. Also, there are mechanisms in place in each country 
And in Congo, we have a plan. And sure, we hope we can uh, vaccinate 60% of the population. We decided which groups needed to be vaccinated first. The first stock of AstraZeneca wasn't delivered yet. Uh, we were supposed to get 120,000 doses and we're still waiting for them, but we received from China the Sinopharm vaccine. We have started the vaccination campaign and I think 10,000 uh, vaccines were acquired. What I wanted to say is that the government wants to uh, acquire through its funds, what will not uh, be received through the solidarity mechanisms. So people still need to learn about this. We still need to raise awareness about this situation. We are still fighting against COVID-19 and we hope that more people will get uh, vaccinated in the coming days in our country. Uh, Bonanya, okay, can you uh, tell us about vaccination in Kenya? Uh, thank you. And I love where the discussion is going uh, because this is what exactly anti clinical trial is about. Uh, we've discussed about what is coming into the country and how exactly we've been able to do the vaccination processes. Uh, for Kenya, we had 1.1 million AstraZeneca um, vaccine doses coming in through COVAX facility. Apart from that, uh, some of the private facilities have been able to obtain Sputnik V, and we only have at least 50,000 doses. And in the last three weeks, we've only had 130,000 people who have been vaccinated within Kenya. That is an average of 6,000 a day. So if we're looking at 60 to 70 percent coverage within the next two to three years, you can see uh, the possibility of this happening uh, might not be as uh, we would like it to uh, go. And this is how we've, um, we've talked about the community engagement, the lack of acceptance. We've talked about the scalability in terms of the storage, the number of doses that need to be provided. We've also, we already know there's quite a lot of nationalism associated with these vaccines. So these are uh, factors that we need to put into consideration so that we do not go into complacency because we know that the vaccines are available. And that means that for a period of time, especially in low resource contexts, we need to be working with therapeutics apart from uh, uh, relying on the vaccines because in Kenya by last year we only had like 256 ventilators with less than 500 ICU capacity. So as the waves uh, continue coming without us uh, actually attaining the coverage that we should uh, acquire to obtain the herd immunity within the particular regions, we need to be able to ensure that we are able to provide uh, alternatives, which include treatment uh, for these patients, preventing them from, uh, within Africa, we've seen most of the cases have been mild to moderate with very few mortality last year, but which are increasing. Uh, but it's these severe cases that are overwhelming our healthcare facilities. So we need to ensure that we do not overwhelm our healthcare facilities as we wait for us to be able to obtain this vaccine coverage as has been discussed. Thank you very much. Well, what's for sure is uh, that uh, the virus has not been uh, beaten in Africa. So how do you see the upcoming months, all of you? Are there any priorities that need to be uh, taken? Noël Tordo. Yes, most likely there are priorities. There are a number of things already. I heard a number of things and I just want to come over uh, a couple of things. I heard the word solidarity, international solidarity. Um, we saw uh, 
from the health policy and the vaccination policy, there has been a lot of geopolitics. And so, for example, we're talking about vaccines now, but at a certain point in Guinea, and I think that this is the case in many Afri African countries, we uh, were struggling to receive t testing kits, and it's thanks to the generous generosity of donors, Chinese donors, that we were able to uh, obtain a tests uh, from Alibaba and other countries, companies, and we were able to receive kits to do screening. Well, I have a question about that. What about the Chinese and Russian vaccines? Do they have side effects? I'm sure we'll hear about as side effects. There are side effects with all vaccines. I don't want to get into that. Okay, let's not deviate from the conversation then. Perhaps we can talk about it later on if you wish. As I was saying, solidarity has been demonstrated by a number of international donors the AFD, for example, the French uh, Development Agency has provided uh, money so that we could buy kits. And, and this is linked to what you asked. And that is to say, uh, can we implement a research programs? There are two research programs that I know. One was mentioned earlier on. That's the Aryakov program. And that was interested well, it's, it's managed by IRD in a number of countries. We have a, a repair program as well at the Institut Pasteur. And so these programs enable us, so I mentioned repair, it enables us to see how the African population overall has fared in this epidemic. What about the immune response among the population? How was that developed? Were there reinfections? All of this requires research, of course. And this research will provide us with a number of new elements. We're researchers at our institute, and so we're always thinking about the aftermath. And what happens afterwards can help us understand what's coming. And there are a number of interesting research programs that have been implemented about the infection of the population through the during the first wave. Can an infected person be reinfected? Yes, that's possible. You know, we have seen this with the flu, for example, we know that we have to be inoculated every year. And so we're learning a number of things and we can do this by an analyzing what's happened. And this will mean that we can be more effective the next time. Once again, I will cite the example of Ebola. Ebola was much better managed this time because we were able to develop a vaccine following the first wave. And so this is how we're able to prevent the spread of Ebola, as was the case in the first wave in 2013, 2016. So we're always learning. And as I said, the research programs that I know, there are, I'm sure, many others. There is a lot that needs to be done in terms of research, which was neglected in terms of anthropology. That is to say, how can different communities, earlier on we mentioned uh, people who use different types of treatments, not just medicines, uh, Western medicines. They also use um, other medicines from the forest, from trees, for example. And so we cannot be in Africa without thinking about the communities. And so I think that there is a lot of research in terms of anthropology, in terms of um, the research that can be done in the West and how to apply it in uh, Africa as well. So these are things that are very important and these are uh, areas of research that we need to focus on, I think. Mrs. So, what are the prospects in your opinion for the coming months? How do you see things evolving with your uh, anthropologist perspective? Do you see uh, that populations are becoming fed up for economic reasons? Do you think that there will be riots as we've seen in Senegal? Senegal? I know that that was for political reasons, but I think it's very revealing of the very tense uh, political situations. Well, I think uh, that today, if uh, there is a third way, and uh, I'm pretty sure there will be a third wave. Well, the measures that were implemented, I think, uh, will uh, struggle to be respected. So we need to take into account 
the people, we need to vaccinate people. And in terms of health policies, I think we need to remember that Africa is going through a demographic transition. There are more and more people suffering from non-communicable diseases today in Africa. And there are 30 to 40 percent of people who are over 60 who suffer from high blood pressure, for example. So I think this pandemic is an opportunity to take a look at prevention, at how we take care of people. We need to take into account chronic illnesses and uh, study other dimensions of uh, health in Africa. And yes, I do believe that we need to take into account communities. We are uh, going through a cycle of emerging pandemics. And in fine, uh, we need to uh, do some capacity building. We need to reinforce our health structures. We need to learn from this pandemic. And we need to find solutions to improve our health systems. And of course, we need to do more research. Uh, research should guide uh, decisions and social sciences, I think, should also uh, guide policies. We need to find the right solution. And I will end on this in Senegal. Um, the research that was done on vaccines uh, um, it was an opportunity to make notes for the for the authorities for the government we transmitted our research to the authorities and they actually took uh, our notes and our reports into account uh, in their uh, vaccination policy so the results of our research were actually used so that's really operational research and social sciences also have a role to play and can help improve the situation glenda what are the perspectives for you in the coming months at the forefront of the crisis in South Africa? Well, I think what we want to do is we want to make sure that we rapidly scale up our vaccination program and that we get to the, the millions of South Africans that need to be vaccinated. And um, hopefully um, um, we were able to complete our phase one of the vaccine program, which is vaccinating healthcare workers by the end of um, May, um, early June, to be able to go to our phase two, which is our essential, our essential frontline workers, our people with over 60 and, and people under 60 with comorbidities. And so um, there has been, we, you know, we, we only have vaccinated 250,000 healthcare workers in South Africa. Um, and the delay was because um, we needed to find and acquire vaccines that that um, were appropriate for our country and that works against our variant. Um, what we also have to do, so I do believe that this is the year of therapeutics. Um, although we found a vaccine that that is efficacious, um, there's been very little movement on on good therapeutics. Our country has uh, is using ivermectin um, in a in a, in a compassionate use program. Um, yet, um, I, but I do think that at a global level. Uh, we will make strides in, in therapeutics to, to manage uh, COVID. We have huge mortality in South Africa. And, um, and as like many of you, we run out of oxygen and sometimes only have 24 hours, less than 24 hours supply of oxygen. So we have huge uh, mortality in South Africa around uh, COVID and we are um, about to enter our third wave. We also are worried about emerging variants and the impact that these emerging variants will have on, on our vaccine efficacy. We're watching for viral escape, and um, it's important for us to make sure that our vaccine program works, um, as well as um, we find new therapeutics. So we are, we are working with um, Operation Warp Speed and, um, and BADA to make sure that we start to evaluate the new variants, the new, the new um, second generation uh, vaccines, the Moderna vaccine, and also, we're also very interested in, in, in there's a big problem with HIV infection um, to date. Um, all the vaccines that, that have been, have been uh, evaluated have shown, little, have, have shown a huge uh, little impact on HIV infection. 
So if you look at the Novavax, you look at the j and vaccine, there's huge problems with vaccine efficacy in HIV infected people. We have to address that. We have to find um, so with 7 million South Africans who are HIV infected. If we don't manage COVID infection in HIV infection, uh, we're going to get um, you know, poorly controlled um, uh, issues and issues around uh, potential chronic shedders and viral escape again. So we do need um, to look at monoclonal antibodies um, together with vaccines for HIV infected people in South Africa. Over. Well, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. I'm now going to give the uh, floor to Barna Nyauke. I imagine that what uh, Glenda Gray just said, I imagine you find that stimulating. Um, there is this kind of race against the, 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 the clock, in fact, whilst we wait for vaccines. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. So just to follow up, because she's covered it uh, quite beautifully in terms of uh, currently there's no vaccine that would ever be able to fully suppress the need for therapeutic treatments. And as we see in terms of our context, we need to be able to uh, provide alternatives because, as I mentioned before, we have that great push for the vaccines. We need to uh, uh, obtain this coverage of a period of time, but with the scalability issues that we've seen and acceptance that we've seen, um, it's going to take a bit of time. In the meantime, we have our mortality rates increasing. We have our hospitals in some areas within the continent which are being overwhelmed with the numbers because to start off, we did not have the capacity to be able to handle uh, such cases of critical or critical care management of these cases. So uh, also my thoughts in terms of um, what our perspective is coming from DNDI and our partners, we see there's a very great need for us to increase um, the clinical trials and clinical research within our um, within Africa, because we definitely need research questions that are applicable to our context. And when we rely on research from other areas, you find that it is harder for us to be able to apply this within our context without putting all the variables that are required in place. So um, from our end, we hope that we're able to get more data. We would have more guidelines. Different countries are, doing, are using different drugs for the treatment of their patients. Hydroxychloroquine, even though has been um, uh, there's been strong uh, recommendation against it, a number of countries are still using it for treatment. Uh, different uh, healthcare facilities within the same country use different guidelines. So we're hoping with Antikov and other clinical trials on therapeutics that are coming on, we'll be able to provide us with better clinical data that would be able to influence our treatment guidelines. Thank you very much. Lucia Monga in Congo, how do you see the months coming up and the upcoming weeks? Well, please allow me to speak generally. It's not just applied to Congo. If the vaccine was the, clear, the key to this issue, we would have been over and done with this issue. But we have continued to have epidemics. And we've had vaccines for yellow fever, for example. And so it's not just by waving a magic wand that uh, the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 is going to disappear from the face of the earth. It will help, vaccines will help. But we need to figure out what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is to limit deaths, and the most severe cases of COVID. And there is so much uncertainty around the vaccine. Of course, it will protect. Of course, it is effective. But what variants will it protect against? For how long? I don't want to rain on anyone's parade. On the contrary, and uh, my two previous colleagues mentioned this, the vaccines are just a tool, an important tool, but they're a tool as part of a group of other tools that we need to continue to work on optimizing. And we can start by applying the most simple measures. 
washing your hands, wearing a mask, social distancing, anything that is possible to limit the spread of the virus. So inoculate, yes. But I agree with my colleagues. If we have treatments that enable us to avoid severe cases, and if these treatments are available where they need to be available, at the times they need to be available, for the people they need to be available for, we will be able to fight against this problem. So yes, vaccination will help us, and we can see this in the United States. The CDC has said, on a US uh, channel, they said that they were scared about the future. And they're one of the countries that have inoculated the biggest population. And so yes, the vaccine is an important solution to slow down the spread of the virus. We'll be able to reduce it, but we won't be able to wipe it out. And so the message that I would like to send is that we're going to live with this virus for, an, for a while now, we're going to continue to contain the virus, but to get there, we need to ensure that we manage the pandemic smartly, intelligently. And that means that we need, we need to use all of the measures and all of the tools at our availability, at our disposal. Thank you. So Mr. Ndembe, let us conclude with you. So as Mr. Monga just said, we need to, see this new virus as part of our global and African reality. Do you agree? Absolutely, I do, I fully agree with him. Just one point, when we take a look at Israel, for example, and you will see that we have observed a decrease in the number of new cases in Israel due to the impact of the vaccine on the pandemic. What I mean to say, is yes, it is true. We do uh, need to have other things in our toolbox, not just the vaccine. We need other biomedical methods, if possible, other treatments, so that we can control the spread of the virus. However, I think that we need to learn to live with it for at least the next two or three years. That's our uh, position here. But this is not new. We have seen pandemics before that reoccur. We need to prepare ourselves. What the African Europe Union is doing is to ensure that there are platforms in place to produce the vaccine. And that's my concluding point, really. There are pharmaceuticals on the uh, continent, and what we need to do is increase the capacity uh, to produce vaccines on the continent with a view to uh, fighting against a pandemic of this nature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of our speakers. I would like to thank you very much for taking part in this conference. I think that we have really touched upon a number of challenges uh, and we've discussed the African response to uh, this pandemic. I think that we could talk about this for a number of hours. We could talk about variants, uh, uh, vaccine resistance. We could also talk about uh, social resistance as well uh, in the face of the uh, government's recommendations. But I think that we have covered a number of very important uh, points anyway. Uh, thank you very much to all of the speakers. Thank you um, for... For, for playing the game. Thank you for, for joining us and thank you to everyone uh, who uh, has watched us. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.